Hey guys, welcome back to Games of War. What you see laid out before you are Sega Saturn's final five games to be released in North America. After these five games, that was it for the console. And this is a very special video for me because this was my original breakout idea to start my YouTube channel. I wanted to start out talking about these final five games and somehow I got pushed to the back and I've always been thinking about doing this video. I just never got around to it. And I hope you guys have also enjoyed the increased production in the channel if anybody has noticed I've really found my passion again for making videos and I'm really having a good time and this is how I want it to be a steady stream of content not asking for anything in return just the good conversation that's been going I really appreciate it you guys you know I put up a video and within a day it's close to a thousand views over a hundred likes tons of comments I don't care about numbers I just love interacting with you guys I love hearing your questions and input and comments I made a DS collection video a couple days back and I've already gotten four or five great suggestions for games that I didn't have and I looked them up on eBay that's why I do this I absolutely love your responses and your comments so guys just keep doing what you're doing and I'll keep doing what I'm doing uh, enjoy the video Sega Saturn's final five alright guys starting things off with the original OG House of the Dead now this was released in arcades in 1996 Finally ported to the Saturn by WoW Entertainment, released in 1998. House of the Dead was a long time coming to the Saturn. My personal favorite uh, light gun series of all time, House of the Dead. Absolutely loved the series, the horror theme, zombies, the brutality and violence. Unfortunately, this was kind of a rushed port. Uh, it wasn't done with the kind of passion that I would have loved to see. And with great ports of Virtua Cop and Virtua Cop 2, it was a given that Saturn was definitely capable of producing the quality visuals and just a production value. It was capable, sadly, the Sega Saturn version of House of the Dead was rushed, running at roughly 20 frames per second and just looking very rough around the edges. Those issues aside, it didn't really affect the fun factor of the game. The Sega Stunner worked great. In terms of a game, Playing as G, Special Agent, you've got this Dr. Kyrian who's like a madman conducting these inhumane experiments and tortures, and it's your job to take this guy down. And the game is, as is stated, a light gun shooter in the arcades. It's not the most deep game around. If you like light gun shooters, you already know what to expect in this one. You've got zombies, all legions of the undead coming at you every second. You're going to be blowing holes in these zombies. Blood's going to be flying. The cool thing about House of the Dead that I always enjoyed was when you're presented with certain gameplay situations where you have to save a civilian and he's kind of got zombies coming in at him. If you are able to shoot the zombies in time and save the civilian, it will open up a branching path where if you fail, you'll go a different route. So that was always cool and helped with the replay value. Uh, it's a lot of fun playing with two players. There's some extras in this. Uh, there's a boss mode and there's a character select, so all is not lost. Despite the rough edges, House of the Dead is still a lot of fun on the Saturn. And it's a shame that it didn't kind of live up to the expectations and kind of blueprints set by Virtua Cop. House of the Dead sadly was rushed and it was the last entry of light gun shooters on the Saturn, which was very sad. Uh, it came out at the tail end of the system's life in House of the Dead really was a fitting send-off. Developed by Camelot and published by Sega, released in the summer of 1998, we finally got Shining Force 3. And to me, Shining Force 1 and 2 were some of my most fond memories of role-playing games back in the 16-bit era, and I absolutely enjoyed Shining in the Darkness and Shining the Holy Ark. Whereas these two games were more or less first-person dungeon-crawling RPGs, Shining Force 1 and 2 and Shining Force 3 were tactical strategy RPGs. And Shining Force 1 and 2 were my kind of introduction to the series as a whole. I'd never played a tactical RPG before that. And Shining Force 3 was a welcome return to the strategy RPG formula that I loved so much with 1 and 2. Uh, this game was bittersweet in the fact that I absolutely got hooked on the game. Me and a buddy of mine played this over 40 hours just passing the controller doing battles 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 he'd play one I'd play one completely hooked on the battle system and characters and what was bittersweet was that I learned Japan was getting two more scenarios for a total of three with an overlapping storyline and a true ending for completing all three scenarios there was even a collector's edition disc released to commemorate all three releases for those that chose to do so and this really angered me I felt like I had stuck with the Saturn when everybody else had jumped ship or never bothered with the Saturn in the first place 
and it was really frustrating. Uh, now, thankfully, there's patched versions. You can play all three scenarios in English, which is a godsend, but back then it wasn't always so. So Shining Force 3 was great and very bittersweet at the same time. An amazing send-off to the Saturn once again, but uh, it was bittersweet not to get the other scenarios, but this was a fantastic tactical RPG. Shining Force is up there with Fire Emblem as my favorite of all time. And this was an amazing game to get in the Saturn's Twilight. Just before the summer of 1998, Sonic Team and Sega brought us Burning Rangers on the Saturn. And I thought this was a really impressive game at the time. I thought the setting was very unique. Firefighting was something that hadn't been done in a lot of games. It was very original, fresh. Uh, graphics, 3D, was very impressive for the time. Although it did have some problems with draw in, draw distance, pop up, and things of that nature. Overall, I thought it ran very smooth. I thought the concept of being on a futuristic firefighting team known as Burning Rangers, where your job is to go into these uh, disaster areas where you know, there's fires breaking out and putting out these fires. The fires go out, these jewels pop out, you use the jewels to save people that are trapped in these buildings. I thought the levels were put together very well. The on-the-fly navigation system worked really well, very impressive for the time. I loved that there was like audio clues and you'd walk in an area and music would pop up and you'd hear something rumble and jump out of the way at the last minute and use your jetpack to kind of zip around the levels and avoid these fires and explosions. I thought it was a really fun, fast, and, and brilliant game at the time from Sonic Team. Uh, it definitely the Saturn was on its way out at this time and they found fit to release a really ambitious game for the time. The 3D control pad that you got with Knights was uh, usable in this game, so that made the controls very smooth. Overall, I think Burning Rangers was a very strong entry and a very fitting send-off for the Saturn. Magic Knight Ray Earth ended up being the very final game released for the Sega Saturn. And this was really sad for me at the time. I knew this was going to be the last game. And it's very interesting because this game was announced back in like 1994 when the Saturn was unveiled. It came out the following year in Japan and amidst of all kinds of internal problems at Working Designs getting this game out, it took four years to finally get the game. Uh, in the back of the instruction manual, they kind of have the production notes where they tell you about the process of making the game and uh, just production notes and interesting tidbits. They stated that there was a hard drive crash and they lost a lot of the work and progress of the game and it had to be specifically rebuilt for the US release. And uh, a theme song had to be changed and Things were changed, it just kind of kept them delays and delays and delays, really holding them up. So it's amazing this game was released at all. And I thought it was a very unique action RPG. It wasn't very long, it was a short game, but I thought the three character concept where you could play as three characters and switch between them at will, bow and arrow and sword and such, so different uh, characters are better for different situations when fighting the enemies. Very brilliantly done in terms of visual design, very bright, vibrant colors, the animated cutscenes were great, and the story kind of follows the original story arc of the manga, and it, the game actually has some extra characters and extra scenarios, it kind of builds and expands upon the anime. Uh, overall, for a last game, it's a fitting send-off. At the time of review, uh, some people kind of trashed this game, they said that it took too long to come out, and by the time it did release, it was kind of stuck in the past, it wasn't 3D or anything. But a lot of people did praise it. They kind of compared it to a Zelda-ish kind of adventure. Uh, overall, Magic Knight Ray Earth has become quite collectible. And as always with working designs, they kind of did a run where they did different character on the disc. Uh, I believe this one is actually the most sought after. I think her name is Fu. I could be mistaken. But uh, the one with the red hair, I believe, is the most sought after. I'm not sure. But working designs always did something special like this. Printing... Uh, multiple different variants of the disc with different characters and different art. Uh, so all in all, this game really was a great final game for the Saturn. It was sad to see it go, but I was happy to finally get the game, and I'm always such a big fan of Working Designs. Their localization and script really made this game a lot of fun to play. It was funny, and I was compelled from start to finish to experience this one last masterpiece. Saving the best for last, Panzer Dragoon Saga. And this game has kind of grown into a mythical status, and not just because it's expensive. And it really is rare in the fact that only, I think, 10 to 20,000 copies were made for the North American release. It was very limited. And what's interesting is that Panzer Dragoon was born on the Sega Saturn with the first game. This was the first real impressive launch game from a technical standpoint. Don't get me wrong, I love to stall. 
uh, 2D brilliance, but Panzer Dragoon really showed people of what the next generation meant at the time. You know, the Saturn with its surprise launch that just kind of backfired on them uh, produced one very, very impressive game in Panzer Dragoon, and the second one was even more impressive at the time, and Panzer Dragoon Saga actually started development when uh, Zwei started development. This uses the same engine, they just had to tweak it to allow for a more open experience. These games were obviously on rails. Uh, Panzer Dragoon Saga was an RPG where there was some exploration, so you could fly in different directions and explore, and you also could get off the dragon and explore on foot. And an epic battle system was tailor-made for this game. Now, Panzer Dragoon Saga is one of my favorite RPGs of all time, and I still remember the day going to get this. I had picked up one of these games, I can't remember which one, maybe Shining Force. I remember the guy saying to me, you know, hey, uh, Panzer Dragoon Saga is coming out soon, and you better pre-order it because it's going to be limited. And I was like, oh, well, shit, you know, I pre-ordered it. And I remember driving to pick this up. They called me and said the game was in, and I had a Camaro back then. I was a teenager, and threw my friends in the car with me, like, oh, come on, video games suck. I want to play guitar. And, no, we're going to get this game. Shut up. Got in the Camaro. Heavy metal was blasting. I was cruising, just flying there. And I, I remember this specifically. I was cruising, you know, everybody was smoking in the car. I wasn't even paying attention. And I, I blew right through a light. Blew right through a red light. And I was like, oh, oh shit, you know. And I'm like, oh, looking around to see if a cop was there. And sure enough, there was a cop, but he was up about two blocks in the side. He didn't see me around the red light, man. I was just freaking out because I was like, oh my God, I'm not going to. Because the store was closing and I, I was kind of pressed for time. And I just, I'll always remember speeding through that red light to get Panzer Dragoon Saga. And uh, I got this thing home and I was just blown away. A four disc love affair I, I had with this game. And uh, there's a really interesting story that I read recently about this game that the development cycle was really troubled and, and two people ended up dying during the development of this where one guy got in a motorcycle accident and one guy actually committed suicide and the producer kind of said, you know, this was a crazy time. Uh, the long, long work shifts, uh, mandatory weekends, and they were just working around the clock to get this done. And uh, it's, it's sad that that had to happen and the producer said that a lot of people wanted to just quit after the deaths. They wanted to stop work on the game, but they soldiered through and, and gave us this epic game. Uh, combining Panzer Dragoon with an RPG, you get an amazing battle system where you kind of fly around the enemy and avoid their attacks and you've got a little compass that shows you in green or red and you've got to kind of explore onto the weak point and then start attacking. There's dragon morphine, there's different attacks. It's really a brilliant battle system. I really in became engaged with the story, playing as Edge. You are a hired uh, mercenary and you are guarding ruins that are being excavated and one day there's an attack and a girl is stolen that has kind of been stuck into stone and she's a relic and she's taken away and this guy Kramen comes and kills your fleet and it's a story of revenge. It's told very well. This just blew me away at the time. I didn't know the Saturn could pump out game that looked this good and, and played this well and felt so epic. This really does hold up. It's not often in console history that five of the best games available on the platform are released in the system's final months. The Sega Saturn went out with a bang, not a whimper. And it's really sad, overall, the tale of the Saturn. From the botched, surprise early launch that did nothing but piss off consumers, stores that were getting ready to stock the Saturn, companies that were trying to have games ready for the launch, the $100 more price tag than the PlayStation, debacle all the way through and through, the $100 higher price point than the PlayStation, the last minute throwing in of generic processors to compete with the 3D of the PlayStation. All of this was a mess. It was a complete mess. It was a mess following that mess of an ad on the 32X where every game was rushed to the market. No game had a proper development cycle. It didn't seem powerful. It seemed like a waste. Bad decisions. The Saturn followed that. And it's just a sad setup because the Saturn really was a great system. We didn't get a Sonic game. Uh, Sega tried, they did try to kind of save it, but it didn't last long. A couple years after the system was out, you got an asshole saying the Saturn's not their future. So right there was a nail in the coffin. Why support a system that's not the future? It made no sense. So many mistakes, miscommunication between Sega of America, Sega of Japan. Aside from the final five Saturn games, there's a ton of other great games on the system. 
Real quick for horror fans, you gotta check out Lunacy Enemy Zero. Some great darker games. Uh, arcade, Die Hard Arcade was a fantastic beat em up. A lot of fun with two players. One original beautiful franchise was born. And that's in the form of Nights into Dreams. This is a classic in every way. It was a great game from Sonic Team. Released to varying mixed opinions. We have a couple of original entities in Clockwork Knight and Bug. Some love it, some hate it. Yet no one could deny the 2D brilliance of the Saturn. Games like Astal, Three Dirty Dwarves, Guardian Heroes just have the most amazing 2D art, animation, fluid movement. These are the Saturn in its prime. It's a 2D powerhouse. The fighting games were amazing. Golden Axe the Duel, Amazing 2D Fighter, Mr. Bones, a new Shinobi game, digitalized graphics. The most fun multiplayer Bomberman game I have ever played in my life. Still a household hit today in the Games of War household. Saturn Bomberman, I don't think will ever be topped. And the only way to see Sonic in 32-bit running in a 3D world is on Sonic Jam, unfortunately. Kind of a museum, little bonus area where you could run around and explore different options and get different Sonic facts. Uh, this is a port of Sonic 1, 2, and 3 and Sonic and & Knuckles. But overall, this is the only way to play Sonic in 3D and kind of think of what could have been. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Uh, give the Saturn some love today. Pop in a game, play it, enjoy its greatness, enjoy its beauty, bask in the Saturn goodness. I've got a Sega Saturn collection video coming soon. Until then, hope you guys enjoyed. Games of War is absolutely nothing without you.